use the Zoom chat. Uh, feel free to use the uh, Zoom chat function uh, if you have any technical issues, uh, and our team can definitely help you out with that. Um, we will also be using the Zoom Q&A option. Um, so be feel free to enter questions into that throughout today's session, uh, but make sure to take a look at the ones already on there and upvote uh, any questions that are similar to the one that you have. Um, please remember to be respectful and post uh, and what you post and remember to not to share any personal information. Uh, to get things started, let's start with a quick poll, just asking where you are joining us from today. All right, looks like the vast majority of people are joining us from Victoria, uh, but we definitely do have a few people from other parts of British Columbia, as well as uh, around the world. So again, welcome everybody. Uh, so I'd now like to introduce you to Kevin Hall, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Victoria. Uh, thanks, Drake, and uh, good morning to everybody from wherever you are. Um, it's great to be able to get together and have a conversation today. I'd also like to start by acknowledge, acknowledging land and language. So I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territories the University of Victoria is located, and also to the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to today. I'd like to particularly pay my respects to elders past and present and pledge to walk together on the path to reconciliation. I'd also really like to highlight that today is International Women's Day, so it's a fantastic opportunity to celebrate the, the wonderful accomplishments that go on 365 days a year by our you know, female cohort at the university, be it to students, staff, or faculty. Um, I'm entering my fourth month at UVic as the president. I started on November the 1st, so I'm really, uh, really trying to get to know the university as well as I can. And it's a, just a great opportunity to get together today to connect with you, um, our uh, graduate students at the University of Victoria. And of course, we wish we could have done this in person, but the uh, pandemics kind of put a little bit of a damper on many of our plans over the last a year, and almost a year exactly, since we were shut down in Canada. And so we're doing the next best thing, so we're having this town hall. So it's an opportunity for me to, uh, to listen to you today, for you to ask some questions, and um, you know, I'll try to answer them as honestly as I can. You just keep in mind, I've been at the university for four months. I know, uh, let's say quite a bit about the university now, but uh, not everything there is to know about, uh, about you, Vic. I want to assure you as a former vice president of research at two universities, the University of Guelph in Canada and the University of Newcastle in Australia, research is at the top of my mind and graduate students uh, in my uh, opinion are absolutely at the, um, at the core of our research business. It's really the engine room that drives research at a university. And um, grad research is really a true part of what makes uh, the University of Victoria a fantastic university. And the contributions you make, whether they're in the classroom, in the laboratories, out in the field, in the, in the theaters and cinemas are absolutely critical to creating a healthy um, environment, both regionally and, and globally. Um, making uh, significant impacts in social conditions and economic conditions and or environmental change is really something that's driven by the research enterprise at a university. And I know it's been a really tough time for all of you over the last uh, year um, because uh, we've had to really change the way we do business. But I'm very um, hopeful and optimistic that this is about to change uh, fairly soon. The uh, vaccination program that's going on across Canada seems to be um, rolling out well now. Um, and I think this afternoon, we're expecting a very significant announcement from our public health officer in uh, the province of British Columbia around universities in particular that are gonna indicate, I think that we'll be able to come back uh, to campus um, in September in, in a much bigger way than we are now. Of course, uh, if I had a crystal ball and could predict where the pandemic uh, would actually go, I, I'd, I'd uh, wouldn't have a day job as a president, but um, you know we'll have to, we'll, we always take our advice from the public health officer, but I think there's going to be some good news this afternoon. I thought I'd tell you a little small thing about myself. I'm the first in my family to go to university, the first to get a bachelor's degree, the first to get a master's degree, the first to get a PhD, but uh, of uh, four children in my family now, um, we all have bachelor's degrees of three masters and uh, two PhDs, two of us are academics, and to our uh, school, school assistant teachers. And the reason I tell you that is because it's led to my lifelong 
commitment to uh, higher education, uh, to a university being a place that can really uh, be an equalizer in your lives, can be a slingshot in, in your career. And it's a really significant that we always look at how we can um, make universities available to more of the population that go there now. 35% of Canadians get to go to university. Wouldn't it be nice if that was a higher number? So I'm in the midst of my listening tour. I'm really getting out, trying to meet with the community, uh, with students, staff, and faculty. I, I'm told I've met over 2,000 people in the last four months in, in 110 meetings. Those are both our internal and external members of, of the Victoria community. Um, I've had lots of meetings with uh, uh, the staff, students on on one on one basis. This is a great opportunity to get together with you as graduate students today. And I've been meeting with politicians. I've been meeting with uh, local governments. I've been meeting with NGOs around town to really try to understand, you know, what UVic is all about. What what do we? How are we perceived out there in the community? And and where can we? build our, our vision for the future. And part of the reason I'm interested in talking to you today is to get your ideas about what would make UVic the kind of place um, you'd wanna work, you'd wanna study, and how UVic can really change um, the social, environmental, and economic conditions in the region and across the country. Um, so far, the themes that are coming out of my listening tour are, first of all, our research is, is, should be a top priority for this university. Certainly graduate student um, support, uh, graduate student resources are, are, keeps coming to the top of the list. Um, truth, respect, and reconciliation, decolonization is, is something that uh, we have a deep commitment to and, and something we're actually going to really start to drive even harder. Um, equity, diversity, inclusivity, access to education are also really critical things for the University of Victoria, and we're going to embark on, a, on a, an action-based um, plan uh, in the next few months. Climate action, including uh, divestment, has, has uh, come to the top uh, in many of the meetings I've had. Uh, the sense of community engagement, how can you Vic, get out there and really try to make a change in the community is, has, has continually come to the top as one of the top topics. And I think, um, you know, it, it would be remiss not to mention COVID. You know, when, when can we get back to doing what we do as a university? When can we have the safe resumption? of our research programs, both in the labs and out in the fields and in the theaters, et cetera. And so uh, hopefully we're gonna have some good news today, like I said, around the, the uh, COVID situation. So that's really all what I wanted to start off with. We've got lots of questions to answer today. So perhaps what we're gonna do now is we're gonna flip over and have another Zoom poll. Zoom poll. And the question here is, you know, what would you focus on if you were the university's president? And you asked to choose up to three here, with multiple choice questions. Okay, well, there you go. There's some interesting results. We're looking at about 64% equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, access to education, 64% is also a, 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 big, uh, a, a big thing to focus on. The other is truth, respect, reconciliation at 53%, and of course, community engagement, global opportunities, research impact. So uh, thanks for that, everybody. Um, and, and thanks for taking part in this uh, connecting listening tour that I'm in, in embarking on. I'm really trying to understand the culture of you, Vic, and thanks very much for giving, giving us that feedback. Uh, at the end of my listening tour, which will be sometime towards May, I'll share with you, uh, share with the whole community what I've learned on the, on the tour by, we'll publish uh, a number of videos and a couple of uh, reports so that you know exactly what we've been hearing across the campus. So Drake, I'll turn it back to you now. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, and again, welcome you to you and everybody else to the today's town hall. Uh, so the way that this is gonna work is the GSS has created five kind of broad themes and we've asked some of our members to produce videos, about one minute long videos. Uh, so we're gonna go through each of those, each of those videos ask a question Kevin will answer each of those. And then once we've gone through all five of those, we'll turn our attention over to the Zoom Q&A session. Uh, and Kevin will answer a few of those questions as well. Um, so just a reminder, use that Zoom Q&A if you have questions yourself, uh, but also make sure to take a look and upvote any similar questions uh, just to kind of make it easier for us to moderate it. Um, so let's start off with the first video. Hi, my name is Chrissy Schellenberg, and I am a graduate student representative for the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences. As UVic begins to make a COVID-19 recovery plan, graduate students have raised some concerns and have questions for what that might look like. 
The most frequent question that I received was the following. If courses return to in-person, would that be mandatory for all students enrolled in that course, or would there be accommodation provided for students that wish to not return to campus because they feel unsafe due to COVID-19? Students also wanted to know how the university will respond to potential competitiveness for course enrollment if the number of students that are allowed to be enrolled for a course is limited in order to maintain safe COVID-19 protocols. Finally, what would be the threshold for confirmed cases of COVID-19 on campus for in-person classes to be canceled and returned to an online format? Would this threshold also be the same for graduate students working in a laboratory setting? On behalf of UVic graduate students, thank you so much for your time for addressing our concerns. Well, great. Thanks for that question. That's a fantastic uh, question. It's got a lot of pieces to it. And uh, I'm not sure we know all the answers to all of the questions that you've asked, but I'll start off really by saying that it's been about a year now since we were urgently asked to begin measures to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, since that time, in a, in, a, in a year, we've moved from face-to-face uh, -face classes to online. We've eliminated international travel. We began facilitating re uh, working remotely. We've helped students and residents return home. We suspended much of our on-campus and creative activities. Um, that was early on in the pandemic. And since then, we've been starting to slowly come back onto campus and resume some of our in-person activities. But the world has really changed in the way we never could have imagined. Um, we've all gone through so much as a community over the past year. First of all, I wanna express my appreciation to all of you for the extra effort that's been required to get through this pandemic. And it's affected every part of our lives, including your studies. Dr. Henry's recent announcements about the accelerated vaccination plan have given us um, lots of reason to be optimistic that we're gonna to return to campus sooner than we've been thinking would be possible. And I think uh, you'll hear the announcement this afternoon and very, very pleased. We are working towards a full return to campus in September, and we're going to offer as much face-to-face -face as we can. We, we're hoping there will be a change to um, social distancing rules on our campus that will apply to both our, our classrooms and into our lab spaces and our research spaces. But of course, this will be subject to the public health officer and a successful vaccination campaign. We hope to announce more in the next few weeks, and we'll also be announcing more in May when our fall timetable is released to keep you informed. But predicting the pandemic is extremely difficult. Um, so we're planning to have a step back program and any decision to remove uh, to move more of our programming online or offline again will be directed by the public health officer. I think we are absolutely evaluating the possibility of hybrid delivery. Part of your question was, you know, will some of us have the ability to still learn online? And I think what we've learned through this pandemic is that teaching and learning styles for our students all vary. What we are committed to as an institution is trying to move forward and making sure we can offer the best experiences for, for all of our students who study in different ways. Does that mean we're going to have 100% face-to-face -face and 100% uh, online in a, in a sort of duplication mode? Ab absolutely not. We, we just couldn't afford to deliver that type of education. Our, our budgets are very fixed, as you know, by the, by the money that the province gives us and by our student fees. But I think uh, some form of hybrid learning will, will be the future where some of our classes uh, are delivered uh, on an online basis, others are delivered on a face-to-face -face basis. So I wish I could give you more specific details, but, but we, we, we're looking at all possibilities and we're trying to differentiate how we might do different courses differently, but we're really waiting for this extra information we're going to get from the uh, public health officer to determine exactly what will happen in, in September this year. Uh, we'll try to keep you posted as soon as we really find out ourselves uh, the clarity around what we're able to do. But I think you know online learning will be a part of our future for quite some time. Uh, not necessarily because of the pandemic, but because of some of the points that you brought up in the question. So thanks for that. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so moving on to the second question, uh, the second video is again kind of on COVID, uh, but more specifically on graduation and timing. Uh, so if you want to start off the second video. Hi there, I'm Greg Galva, the GSS rep from the chemistry department. Since March of 2020, grad students at the University of Victoria have been forced to adapt to their new surroundings. While Zoom calls and home offices have become our new normal, some work still requires us to be on campus. Particularly students in the hard sciences 
have been locked out of their labs for months and we still only have part-time hours to accommodate COVID restrictions. How do you plan on helping grad students navigate these restrictions? And specifically, how do you plan to help grad students to graduate as close to on time as possible? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question too. That's a that's a great um, that's a great question again. Which there's a lot of uncertainty at this point in time. We hope it'll get clarified in the next uh, few weeks to few months. Certainly, restricted access to the labs and other research space, including your own offices, has been a, a big concern for us. Access to facilities such as labs uh, in the Faculty of Science are determined by the Safe Work plans. These plans are developed by the people on our campus using the guidelines that come from the provincial health officer. And those guidelines for us are not um, a man, they're, they're not a choice we make, they're actually mandatory. We have to make sure we, we work to the provincial health officer's guidelines. Uh, UVic was the first university in BC to launch a research resumption plan. So that was following the release of the BC Restart Plan on May the 6th. And the on-campus uh, research resumption really took a phased approach. As of August the 4th, all labs are able to reopen if they have an approved uh, safe work plan. So if your lab isn't open, um, have a chat with your, um, with your supervisor, uh, with a department head to make sure that, that that lab has a safe work plan to return. If you feel that there's opportunities for a further expansion of safe access to the lab and other research facilities, I would encourage you again to speak to your supervisor or grad advisor. And we may get a little more clarity around that this afternoon or over the next few weeks from the public health officer if we get uh, an idea of the plans that they want us as institutions to put in place. If you're not comfortable approaching your grad supervisor or the department chair, any graduate student can ask advice and confidence from the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies. So I recommend you, you use that route. And for those grad students, if you feel that your progress is delayed um, by the access to necessary coursework, I speak to your supervisor and grad advisor about uh, possible course substitutions. Um, and uh, the fact that grad studies is, is there to make uh, compassionate leaves for those students who felt that they can't use their labs and the facilities fully during the pandemic. It's not a perfect solution, but the fact that grad studies will continue to work with the units to provide those extensions to candidacy and program time that, were, that are appropriate for the delay that you've had. We can't really get back on the, the time that you've lost. Uh, perhaps in the future, we could look at, uh, can we run the labs more than just a regular shift? Um, you know, um, but it is something that is that we're continually thinking about planning. Ultimately, that's going to mean that some of the students won't be able to finish their research programs uh, on the timeline established pre-COVID, and that uh, you should try to use leaves and extensions. So hopefully, that will help reduce the cost in terms of course fees. And um, you know, again, we we apologize for for our lack of ability to do things, uh, but it's, it, you know, it, it's, it, our hands are really tied in complying with these COVID um, requirements that have been uh, hoisted on us by the provincial health officer. And of course, they're, they're not put on there uh, randomly, they're put on there with a lot of great thought to try to really um, reduce the impacts of this pandemic. UVIC is gonna continue to expand the lab access um, as the public health orders are updated. And again, as I mentioned a couple of times now, I think Dr. Henry's announcement um, this afternoon, combined with the accelerated vaccination plan, gives us a lot of reason to be optimistic that it's gonna occur sooner than we thought would be possible. So thanks for that question. Thanks for that answer, uh, President Paul. Uh, so moving on to video three is about funding. Um, well, graduate student funding in particular. Uh, so if you wanna go ahead and start uh, video three. Hi, Dr. Hall. Thank you for taking the time to answer our questions. We really appreciate it. My name is Tiffany Cole, and I'm a graduate student from the Department of French. My question is on graduate funding. Although it has almost been a full year since the COVID-19 pandemic reached us last March, many of us, both domestic and international, are still struggling with increased expenses and limited employment opportunities, both on and off campus. While the university did respond quickly by creating the COVID-19 emergency bursary, that bursary is no longer listed on the SAFA website with the nine other emergency bursaries that exist. In addition to possibly being the ones that were inundated with requests at the start of COVID, they are either exclusively undergrad or open to both undergrad and graduate students. 
With regards to the student population of UVic, which numbers just over 22,000, and of which less than 3,000 are graduate students, what can graduate students, especially international graduate students, expect from the university in terms of long-term support? Again, thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing your response. Thanks, Tiffany, for that uh, question. And obviously, COVID-19 has presented very significant and sudden challenges for all of our students. And we recognize that students were in need of immediate support. And uh, the fact that grad studies has created 300 dean special bursaries. They were $1,500 each. And they were aimed at students who weren't eligible for either federal or provincial COVID-19 aid programs. And that was a, a almost a half a million dollars that was put into that program. 60% uh, of those went to international students. The bursaries were designed to provide grad students uh, who were placed into emergency situations, um, but they weren't designed to provide financial support in the longer term, and I, I acknowledge that. The fact that grad studies will continue to offer support for grad students through compassionate leaves of absence for students who felt they can't continue with their studies due to COVID-19 restrictions. And this will allow um, students to have leaves, uh, a leave to maintain their continuity of registration and also to extend their program time limits. And so while not actively studying or conducting research, that will help hopefully offset some of the costs. We're also working with the departments to provide extensions where appropriate. And as we get, begin a more return, a return to more on campus activities and usual operations, the student awards and financial aid will continue to support students, um, including emergency bursaries. It's, it's something, you know, we, we will look at with, with our budget as well, because as you can well imagine, COVID's created a lot of um, issues for our own university in terms of the way we uh, receive revenue, the way we have our expenditures. We have to put a lot of money into teaching technologies, into these extra bursaries, and we will, where possible, create additional bursaries to help offset some of the, um, some of the need in our student community. I would say finally, if there is a, you know, if you have a really compelling uh, case, please, you know, work with your, your dean uh, and, and, and the dean of graduate studies to bring your case forward and we'll see where we can help. We're out reaching out to our alumni to see how they can help us out. And we'll do everything we can to make sure people are taken care of. So thanks for that question, Tiffany. Thank you, President Hall. Uh, moving swiftly on to our fourth video. Uh, so this one is on community engaged research and funding. Uh, so if you wanna go ahead and start up the fourth video for us. My name is Erin Donald and I'm a doctoral candidate in the School of Nursing. Students from groups who have experienced structural inequity often come to UVic with strong existing ties to community, either as workers or as community members. This allows them to form valuable research partnerships. Truly community-based research requires meaningful reciprocity, and this reciprocity almost always comes back to infrastructure and funding. This becomes an equity issue when these students who are passionate about this research and are well positioned to do so, are unable to access funding in competitions that favor markers of previous academic privilege. These students can support UVic in achieving its strategic goals of engaging locally and globally and of fostering respect and reconciliation? Will UVic support graduate students who are engaging in research and partnership without relying on competitive metrics drawn from existing markers of structural advantage? Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for that question. I guess I would start off uh, by just trying to recap some of my remarks earlier about my own uh, situation of being the first in family to go to university. And it wasn't uh, because there was nobody smart enough in my family to go to university. We just didn't have the capacity or ability for any of the children in my family to, uh, to go to school. Yeah, so equitable access to education is absolutely critical to me. It's going to be a critical pillar of what we will stand for as an institution in the future. The second piece of your question was around community engaged research. And I've spent my own career of 35 years in academia uh, trying to drive um, results in the community, whether it's social change, it's a change in the environment. Uh, my work has, has gone across the world working in marginalized uh, communities, trying to develop safe drinking water solutions, both in, in Canada and across the world. And so I certainly recognize the importance of community engaged research. Um, We've recognized for some time that there's a wide disparity in educational opportunities available to our applicants and that grades and GPAs and even credentials aren't the only way of measuring 
academic potential. So I was really pleased to learn that the Faculty of Grad Studies allows departments to accept students without an undergrad degree, for example, or those that have some relevant life experience. And I think this is really terrific. I haven't got the full details of that. As I mentioned earlier, I'm really new at the university, but I, you know, that, that was very heartening for me to hear. Similar allowances are often made for mature students who might have a bachelor's degree, but, but perhaps a lower uh, GPA. So we do have all kinds of students coming into the system and the research uh, system from, from different backgrounds. Uh, one of the things that we are going to do is establish a new strategic research and creative work strategy. It's called Aspiration 2030. And that's going to help also address ongoing issues around EDI by providing more intentional support to equity deserving researchers, including our students. And I think that's critical for the institution. And while it's true that we use grades, I guess, if you like to calculate eligibility for the largest awards from the faculty grad studies, um, I think it's important that after one year, students can apply based on their GPA solely based on the coursework they've done at UVic. So that by second year, all students can apply for the same awards. Um, is that perfect? Absolutely not. And, and I promise you, we will look at how we can create additional awards for coming into universities from let's call them a non-traditional pathway or a non-traditional metric. The university really recognizes its responsibility for reconciliation. And the faculty grad studies is made available each year, increasing number of grad fellowships that are dedicated to indigenous students. And I think, um, you know, these are awarded through a process by the Office of Indigenous and Academic and Community Engagement. So it's, it's not even done through the traditional academic stream. I think there's a lot of other things we might do. And, and I'd be really look, look forward to some suggestions, Aaron, that you might have, or some of your fellow students might have, and certainly bring them forward in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, speaking of EDI, you mentioned it in your answer there. Our last uh, video is specifically on EDI, uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and start up the fifth of the video, we can go ahead on that topic. Hello, President Hall. I represent graduate students in the biochemistry and microbiology department, and after reaching out to students for their experiences, the issues that have come to me nearly all concern marginalized people facing discrimination in STEM. This is not a new story, but it is one we hope to be actively addressing and maintaining honesty about. I've heard from marginalized people who have tried to address these concerns with departmental members directly and feel that their concerns were not taken seriously or else regarded with annoyance. So my questions are these. How can we promote members of faculty to listen to marginalized voices and give their concerns and suggestions due consideration? How can we promote inclusion and decrease discrimination in STEM? Can we improve working environments for marginalized people in STEM? Can we increase equity, diversity, and inclusion education in STEM? And could we strive for student representation on all departmental EDI committees? Thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, great. That's that's also a terrific question. Thanks very much. And uh, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned when I hear your question and you, th you say that people aren't taken seriously uh, within their departments. And that's absolutely something I will look into. I um, just think there's no space for a lack of tolerance around issues of equity, diversity, inclusivity, anti-racism. And, and my initial impressions after four months at, at uh, UVic is we're doing okay in equity, diversity, inclusivity, anti-racism, but we're not doing enough. Like many large institutions, we've been moving really too slowly. Uh, universities like to have everything perfect, so we spend a lot of time planning and very little time doing things. So what I will say to you today is my leadership team and I were committed to making action happen sooner than later. We shouldn't be planning for the next few years, we should be acting right now. And um, I've been working very closely with the Equity and Human Rights Office. In fact, before I came to the, to the campus, about three months before I came in November, I started working with our EQHR to really design a process that's going to build on UVic's commitment to embedded practices of equity, diversity, accessibility, inclusion, and dialogue throughout the university. And we are going to embark in the next month on a equity-centered uh, equity action plan. So we're actually going to develop a plan by, by doing action. We're going to emphasize doing rather than planning before taking any action. And the plan is going to be centered around the expertise and experiences of our marginalized people on our campus with the aim of really enacting a transformative change. We don't want incremental change anymore. We want to see transformative change. 
This month, we're establishing our first reflection challenge committee. So this committee is gonna be used uh, using the equity-centered principles that recognize and eliminate the barriers to participation by people with lived experience. And they'll be working alongside members of the administration and the leadership team. The committee membership recruitment is gonna begin in March and the action plan hopefully is gonna be finalized and ready to implement by early uh, 2022. On the science side, I'm really looking forward to welcoming uh, Dr. Mina Hurfar to UVic. She's going to become the new uh, Dean of the Faculty of Engineering. And she's got a long career of promoting the work of women in STEM. And she'll start her new role in July. And I think as we move forward with, with other hires uh, of leadership in the, in the science and the STEM areas, we've got to be looking to try to really create uh, diversity of our leaders across the, uh, across the campus. So I think, you know, we're doing, we're doing okay right now, but we, we could be doing much better. And there is a deep commitment now with the leadership team to make sure we start making that transformation. So thanks very much. Thanks, President Hall. Um, so I, think it, I guess it's back to me, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that whoever's watching me you know, we haven't rehearsed this thing at all we're just sort of kicking into it so um you know i think um thanks for those questions those are really really great uh, deep questions and and i'm sure we could spend an hour you know talking and debating each one um now it's time for you to ask some of your questions some of you those of you who didn't do the video we're we're really happy for you to ask questions and I'll have Jake, uh, Drake uh, join me in, in the questions. So um, you, you're going to put the questions into the into the polls, and uh, we'll focus on the most uh, popular questions based on your votes. So um, I'm going to turn that back to Drake, who's been monitoring or will monitor the questions, and we'll try to try to answer as many as we can in in about the next, um, I guess, ten minutes or so. I think we have for questions. Thanks, President Hall. Uh, yeah. So as President Hall noted, we're gonna be using the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, so if you haven't already done so and you have a question you'd like to ask, feel free to throw it in there. Uh, we're gonna answer as many as we can. Um, if there's a similar question already in the chat, instead of posting your own, just upvote that similar question. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, so question number one is, now that UVic has partially divested, what do you see as barriers to the foundation pursuing full divestment and what are potential solutions to these issues? Yeah, great, thanks for that question. Well, I would say, first of all, UVic as an operating business has, has fully divested. That's what we've done with our capital fund. The foundation, which is a foundation that doesn't uh, necessarily have our leadership, but actually, of course, works for us because it's our money that uh, we put into the foundation, um, has been amazingly quiet in terms of what they've actually done around divestment. They've decided to take a platform called socially responsible investment, which actually is the preference in my mind because it not only takes into account a divestment of fossil fuels, it takes into account divestment of uh, funds that support um, modern slavery, funds that support uh, employment practices in, in countries other than Canada that aren't how we would like to look at things in Canada. So there's a number of uh, Canadian uh, international companies who, who um, you know, choose to have very poor practice around a number of things. So for me, socially responsible investment is a, is a much more appropriate term because it's not just about divestment in fossil fuels. What I can say for fossil fuels is the, uh, the foundation uh, has been very quiet on its success and the foundation has reduced its investment in fossil fuels from about $40 million a few years ago to around $3 million this year with a plan to reduce it um, almost to nothing by next year. This has been some very strategic investment that, that the uh, foundation has been making and the university is working closely with the foundation. The foundation knows that this is an important issue for myself and my leadership team. And, and we hope to see how we can quickly uh, divest from uh, fossil fuels, but, but more importantly for me, how we can continue to become or become the, the exemplar in this country around socially responsible investment. Thanks, President Paul. Uh, and then I, 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 perhaps I should have stated this uh, beforehand, that question came to us from Severin Odland. Um, our second question is coming from Aaron Donald and they ask, 
how will students who are medically vulnerable or caring for those that are medically vulnerable be ensured equal access to education uh, if UVic reopens before BC has achieved universal uh, vaccination? Yeah, that's a, that's a uh, good question as well. I think, um, you know, this is part of our planning process that we have to go through over the next couple of months if we plan to return uh, to campus in September um, without uh, knowing that everybody's vaccinated. Of course, there will be people who are vulnerable and can't return to campus and we'll have to make some special accommodations for those people. So that's something that we'll be working on with both the Vice President of Research and the, and the Provost to make sure that we can take care of our, our students and community. And we'll have the same with our staff and faculty. Uh, there will be uh, people that are susceptible to uh, the pandemic. So we'll have to continue to protect as long as we need to. And again, we take our advice on a lot of these issues from a public health officer who will tell us um, when it's appropriate to fully return to campus, when we still need to have some form of protection in place. So hopefully, you know, within the next couple of months, as we get more clarity around the vaccination program, the effectiveness, uh, the, the back to uh, back to work uh, orders from the public health officer, we'll be able to put our plans in place. Thanks, President Hall. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to the next question down. We're going to skip one of them because it's quite similar to the first question that was asked. Um, so the next question comes to us from uh, Trisha. Um, they ask, oh, okay. uh, they ask for those grad students who are affected by incomplete access to their labs. What kind of accommodations will you be providing uh, for them? Sorry, it's jumping around, so I, I got a little mixed up. Um, so for those grad students who are affected by incomplete access to their labs, what kind of accommodations will you be providing uh, for them in terms of financial assistance uh, with enrolling for additional semesters in order to finish their research? Yeah, okay. So I would say, um, you know, right now, if, if there's limited access and you can't get any of your work done, of course, you can ask to defer your studies in which case you have no tuition and, and you're allowed to have the continuity of your program in place. So you should take advantage of that if you're really not being able to get into your lab enough. If your studies are being delayed um, unduly and, and we can't get you started again, perhaps in September, and we can't sort of accelerate the pace of what you do, um, I, I guess the, you know, we're going to look at uh, some bursaries to support uh, those students. I think the other thing is we need to have some good conversations between um, students and, and supervisors to actually have a look at the degree itself, your, your studies, and, and do you have the optimum program? Are you doing the right number of tests to get the right result for your thesis? Is there some way you can change your research program slightly? I think there's a lot of different combinations of things that we can do, uh, and I think it's just a question of being um, you know, having those discussions uh, with your, your supervisor, your, your department around trying to alter and change the, your pathway to the degree. So you might be able to speed it up a little. Um, and in the case where you can't, then you know, we're gonna have to have some discussions around the university about how do we find some funds to, uh, to support students where we can't make changes or accommodations. Thanks, President Hall. Uh, so moving on to the next question. Uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, this one's coming to us from Brianna. Uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks that you see graduate students as integral, central, uh, integral and central to the university's research efforts and impact. Currently available graduate student funding at UVic does not reflect this value. How will you as president work to improve graduate student funding at UVic? Yeah, thanks um, for that question. So I guess I, as a couple of pieces to that, I think um, my initial impressions at UVic are we do a great job in research for the amount of investment we put into it. Uh, so my role as the president is try to, to try to work with my colleagues on the leadership team to take the money we get, which is a limited resource and try to distribute it about all the things we want to do as an institution. I think in the next uh, few years, research will really get a lot more um, attention because it is a critical piece of the university in driving our reputation and solving some of society's biggest problems and issues. And so we will look at where we can sort of uh, take, um, I guess, take money from some other piece of the system and, and push it into research. The grad student funding is a really interesting question because there's three pieces to that to me. First of all, 
we're in a province that funds higher education very well uh, compared to many of the other provinces in Canada. But that's typically at the undergrad level. Um, and so what we've been doing as presidents of universities in, in British Columbia is lobbying the government to try to get a continuation or in fact an increase in the amount of support that gets in, into the grad uh, student support program. Um, I'm not sure whether we'll be successful, but we, we have pointed out to the BC government that, that if you look at Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, there's a significant larger proportion of money put into grad student support. So that's, that's one piece. Secondly, we have to look internally at ourselves and we have to look at what's important to us. And if research is important and grad student support automatically becomes important, we have to make sure we can divert some funds from, from another area. I'm not sure what that would be, but we're gonna work on that to put our own support in. The third piece is around our researchers themselves. We're blessed in Canada with um, research programs, uh, support programs and foundations that allow us to uh, apply for graduate student support. And so we'll work with our academic community to make sure we, we, we chase all the opportunities we can for graduate student support. So I hope through those three mechanisms, government, our own investment as an institution, and perhaps more success at some of these external granting uh, funding agencies where grad student support can, can be had, that will be able to lift the amount of uh, support that goes into graduate student support. Thanks, Preston Hall. Uh, so we'll move on to the next question, which is coming to us from Elaine. Uh, how, do you how do you imagine addressing from non-deficit and non-assimilation assimilation frameworks barriers to accessing university education for folks from, sorry, it jumped around again, uh, for folks from poverty class uh, heritage? What does your vision of a beyond acronym EDI approach look like that includes tackling classism at UVic and Canadian universities by creating in the meantime and structural solutions? Yeah, thanks for the question. And again, I'll just go back to my own experience. My, my experience was uh, my parents emigrated from the UK. Um, my father was a factory worker. Uh, they emigrated because they wanted to give their children access to education, uh, which Canada provided uh, when, back in, when I went <coughs> to university. So my experience in my own family was actually getting away from the classism. Uh, if we fast forward now 35, 40 years time, we, we've developed this in Canada. And I am very concerned by the fact that, um, you know, 95% uh, of the students that come to our university come directly from high school. And I would say of that, 90% of those are totally on, on a marks basis, um, just based on your averages. Um, I have just come back from eight years uh, working in Australia. Um, I was at a university of 40,000 students, 60% of those were um, mature students. Only 40% <coughs> excuse me, came through uh, the traditional route from the high school. I mentioned that because out of those mature students, those were typically students who couldn't go to university for many reasons. Perhaps they were um, from a class that wouldn't allow them to afford the cost of tuition fees in Australia, or perhaps they didn't even get access to good education uh, in a high school. And what the one thing I've learned from Australia is uh, the creation of pathway programs to create an equal platform for everybody, no matter what walk of life you come from, um, is, is critical to getting more and more people into university. And so I'm committed to evaluate, design and develop pathway programs for the University of Victoria, because I would really like to change that dynamic as well. I'd like to make sure that we are a university that's accessible to uh, the diversity of the population, um, those from a low SES, those who have been disadvantaged for other reasons. And we will work hard together as a leadership team to make sure we create these enabling pathways, we create the financial support that's required to put in place. It's going to take time. It's not something we do in Canada as universities. And I, I'm not going to point out that UVic is better or worse than any other university in Canada. It's just something that really hasn't happened in Canada. Uh, universities have become somewhat elitist uh, in, in the way that they admit students. And so we're going to try to, to break that mold. We're gonna to try to work together uh, with our communities, with the marginalized communities to try to find out what's needed to actually really make a change in, in the way that students are um, evaluated and brought into universities and supported while they're here. So thanks for that question. Thanks for that answer. Uh, so we're gonna keep moving on here. Uh, I do want to give a quick reminder to the audience, uh, make sure you're upvoting any 
questions that you've got uh, that you want answered. Uh, we've got time for maybe two, three, maybe four more questions. Uh, so make sure you've upvoted the ones that you're interested in so we're answering the most uh, topical ones. Uh, the next one comes to us from Alyssa. Moving forward, how will graduate student training integrate uh, the practices advocated for by the Tri-Council open access policy and incoming research data management policy? For instance, how does UVic intend to develop an open access policy itself how do you how do we bring graduate student training better in line with academic policies and best practices at the national level? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, this is the one I'll, I'll feign ignorance on in my four months here that I'm not really sure what our open access policy is, and I would be surprised uh, to find out if we didn't actually have one. Um, you know, I, I I guess I would expand a little bit on that question. One of the one of the things that I think is critical. Uh, for a graduate student is to do um, to get some experience above and beyond just your research program or the standard number of courses we ask you to take that are often uh, technical or oriented towards your thesis in, in, in nature. And what I'm familiar with is uh, some programs that I established in Newcastle. Uh, interestingly, in, New in Australia, the um, grad students all report through to the uh, vice president of research uh, rather than the, through the academic ways to the, to the provost. And so we were very big on developing learning opportunities for all of our graduate students. We would have streams on entrepreneurship and innovation. We would have a stream on acad becoming an academic, learning how to write to, you know, papers that, that develop citations or um, research outputs, which capture impact. Um, uh, open access would, would be another piece in that, in that sort of particular stream. We had a stream that was focused on the end users of research, whether it's industry, business, or non-government organizations, or could be the healthcare sector, uh, where students would learn how to do that work. And I'd certainly like to explore with the uh, with the, the uh, dean of graduate studies and with the provost and how we can add value to a um, to a graduate degree at the University of Victoria by going above and beyond what the standard uh, requirement is across this country for for graduate studies. And I think if we were able to do that, um, my experiences in Newcastle, where we thought perhaps 10, 15% of the students would want to take these courses, they, they weren't for credit in the degree, they were just courses. Um, you know, we, we, we expected 500 of the 5,000 graduate students to take these courses. Uh, we ended up after four years having about 3,500 students sign up for these courses. And I think just adding value to a degree is something that we really have to look at. As an institution, it's something I'm committed uh, to do, and we'll be working with the Vice President of Research and the Provost to see what we can do in terms of developing those courses. And that would include uh, the open access question. Thanks, Preston Hall. Uh, so the next question is a bit long, so I'm going to try and <laughs> reduce it a little bit. Um, so I don't, it's not quite as much for me to read. So the first part of the question is, do you see the possibility of a space opening up at UVic and universities around the world for technology such as Landmark Worldwide, which offers training and courageous communication, listening, leadership, and transformation? Okay, Rick, that didn't sound like a long question, but uh, <laughs> I, I think um, I'm, I'm not familiar with um, Landmark Worldwide, um, but, but I think it goes back to um, it's my last answer, really. I, I think, you know, the challenge for us with the university is to add value to a graduate degree, and that would include training with, with outside entities and groups. Um, one of the exciting things we're going to be doing is opening up an innovation network uh, throughout the lower uh, South Island. So that'll be a number of innovation hubs and entrepreneurship hubs that will teach basic business and innovation entrepreneurship to our students, our academic staff, to the community. We'll partner with some of the best in the world to deliver their programs. And so there's an example of what I think is, is you know, we're going to try to add value to a UVic degree. And so certainly um, I would be happy, whoever asked that question, to, uh, to send me a suggestion to have a look at this particular program to see how we might incorporate that in, uh, into, the, into the program itself. Thanks, Professor Hall. Uh, so moving on to the next question, which is coming from Philippe. Um, how do you envision the future of university libraries globally and at UVic? Do you see them as evolving to online services rather than physical services, 
or do you think they are, will persist as a physical repository of knowledge? Yeah, that's a great question too. I mean, I, I guess I, one thing I would say is having been here four months, I realize how good our library at UVic is compared to others I've seen across universities uh, globally. And that is because of the move towards um, a large digital presence as well as a physical presence. Not only a large digital, digital presence, but actually, uh, you know, the staff, uh, many of the staff at the library are very advanced in terms of uh, analytical techniques, um, statistical analysis of data and data trends. Uh, the, the library here has become a repository of tremendous amounts of digital data. Uh, I, I think what I see globally in trends is that we, we will never replace a library as a, as a print form uh, totally because I think there are things around archives uh, of, of old uh, traditional materials that are still subject to lots of great research done in the humanities in particular. Um, but I do think we'll see a, a continued um, involvement of the digital capabilities of libraries, of libraries being more integrated into uh, the departments, the, college, the faculties, um, so that, um, you know, this kind of digital collection, digital capture of data, uh, repository of data that we develop as, as researchers, uh, whether it's uh, science data, it's arts and humanities, it's digital humanities. I think the library has a huge role to play in that space. Um, and I, like I said, I think we're fortunate that we actually have a library that is helping um, invent, if you like, the library of the future. Uh, so I'm very confident that we've got a great team here and that we will be leaders in the country and leaders globally in redefining what a library becomes over, over time. So thanks for that question. Thanks, President Hall. Uh, I don't think we've got time for any more questions. It looks like we're just about at time up. So I'll let uh, you provide any closing statements you might have. Yeah, great. Look, well, first of all, it's been, it's been uh, fun. It's been a pleasure. I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person. And thanks for all the questions that were done, either of the video questions or the questions that you sent in. Uh, hopefully you found the, the, um, the answers informative. Um, uh, you know, some of the questions are very tough in answering, particularly the ones related to the pandemic, because we don't know what's going on. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question today or, um, you know, suggest, share your idea, there is a present suggestion box. You can go to um, uvic.ca backslash suggestion box, all one word. I'd really be happy to receive either your questions or suggestions you may have. And so before we wrap up, we're going to have a really quick uh, Zoom poll. And this is a, a poll that's going to say, you know, what are the effective ways for me as a president to really connect and communicate with you as graduate students and choose, uh, you know, choose three preferred ways of, uh, of connecting with my office. All right, well, there's, there's the results. So meetings with small groups and focused topics at 75%, uh, town halls at 67%, uh, interactive online tools at 50%, the top three ways. And certainly um, small groups on focused topics would be a great, uh, a great mechanism for, for myself and the leadership team to come out and meet with you as graduate students. So thanks so much for participating today. It's, it's really been enjoyable. I hope, I hope there's an exciting year ahead. I'm very optimistic. Uh, this afternoon's announcements by the public health officer, I think, could be transformational for us. I really look forward to a time when we can get together. And if you're ever out on the ring road and you see me wandering around looking lost, please come up and say hello. Um, give me directions or just, uh, you know, I enjoy you know, part of my job as president is really getting out and meeting people. And so the more people I meet, the better. So please, you know, do feel free to come up and, and say hi. Finally, I just really want to thank the organizing team for this event that doesn't occur um, you know, behind the scenes. There's a lot of people who have worked very hard on uh, getting this event together today. So thank you everybody today. Thank you to the GSS and, and, and Drake, thanks to you for doing such a fantastic job of being the MC today. So thanks everybody. Thanks President Hall and uh, thank you to all of the students and their attendance and especially to all of the staff on the back end as well. Uh, in particular, thank you, Sarah, our ASL interpreter, and Alex, our captioner, uh, helped make this uh, event a lot more accessible to students, and that's something I, I greatly appreciate. Um, thank you all for joining us in today's Graduate Student Town Hall. The recording will be posted, though I'm not entirely sure where. Um, and then I'm going to take an opportunity to just give a quick plug. Uh, for those of you, everybody here should be graduate students at UVic. Uh, the GSS is having its semi-annual general meeting in a couple of weeks on March 23rd. I encourage you all to uh, attend. We'll be sending out a notice tomorrow. Um, 
and there's still a couple of vacant positions on the executive board. So consider running for that if you have any interest in it. Uh, but again, thank you all for coming and uh, I look forward to the next event.